I ended up making a promise to myself that if I could ever do anything to help someone else not feel this way, that that would be like my life's mission. And I also thought, gosh, if they just got to know me, they wouldn't hate me so much because I can't, I'm not that bad. I can't be that bad. My name is Linda Laurel, and I'm asking you to have the courage to listen with an open mind to all of our voices because our voices matter. I want to take a moment to thank BMW of West Houston for sponsoring this episode of our Voices Matter podcast. BMW, of course, is known as the ultimate driving machine because of its precision and power. As someone who has driven a BMW for many years now, I can attest to that firsthand. But I think what's even more important, especially about this particular BMW dealership, is that it understands the power and the impact of giving back to its community. BMW of West Houston is known for its support of countless local charities, and that is important to us here at Our Voices Matter podcast. So if you choose to do business with BMW of West Houston, not only will you be getting the stellar first class service that the dealership is known for, but you can also rest assured that you are doing business with a dealership that truly cares about and gives back to its community. Hi, everybody. It's Linda Laurel, and this is Our Voices Matter podcast. Today's one of those days when I'm once again pinching myself because I get to interview the most incredible guests, including today's guest, Sheila Andreen. Sheila is CEO and co-founder of Indie Flix Group, a global streaming service that serves independent filmmakers and provides social impact films, television shorts, and documentaries to create positive change in our world. Now, Sheila first broke into the business back in the day as a costume designer on the television series, The Wonder Years. Yes, I'm talking the original Wonder Years, not the current reboot. And by the way, she has some hilarious stories about how that whole thing came to pass. She also worked on Party of Five, Dawson's Creek, and Smallville. Under the umbrella of Indie Flix, Sheila's most recent film is called Race to be Human, a powerful and important film that will soon be released. It includes the perspectives of young people about this very difficult topic of race that permeates every aspect of our lives. Again, important film for all of us to see, and we take a deep dive as we discuss that and so much more. I hope you'll enjoy my conversation now with Sheila Andreen. Sheila, it is such a pleasure to finally have you on Our Voices Matter podcast. Welcome to the show. Oh, Linda, thank you for having me. I was really excited to be here. Oh, my goodness. Well, we were introduced to each other, I guess, a few weeks ago, and I was so excited to learn about Indie Flicks and um, what you are creating. And I, I love how you describe it as a global streaming and screening service of content for purpose. And that truly speaks to my heart because it's all about the purpose. So when, when as CEO and co-founder of Indie Flix, what were you trying to achieve? Well, you know, initially when I first started Indie Flix, it was more with my partner. Um, it was more about creating a marketplace for independent filmmakers to be able to connect with audience and to monetize their, their art, their stories. That was a long time ago. And at one point we really amassed like, gosh, over 12,000 titles, shorts, features, documentaries, web series from like, I think at one point we had like 80 from 85 countries and we were streaming globally. And I realized that I couldn't even figure out what to watch. I don't know about you, but like even today with all of the people telling me binge this and watch that yeah. on all the major streamers, I can spend a whole night with my husband just watching trailers and not watch anything except maybe a, a rerun of Law and Order. <laughs> and um, we ended up, I ended up sort of feeling like overwhelmed with what to watch and not being very effective at supporting so many filmmakers. So I ended up kind of cutting out like 7,500 titles and re, you know, kind of pivoting the, the streaming service to be more about edutainment mm -hmm. and 
We so we still have we have like four thousand titles from all over the world, shorts, features, docs, and really wanted to have it about raising awareness, making you think, building community, starting conversations, but in an entertaining way. Yeah, and um, so that was kind of the the genesis, the, the idea. The, the yeah, in the process. So starting conversations and educating and having uncomfortable conversations. So um, I'm going to ask you to go into your backstory a little bit. But as you're doing that, I'm going to ask you to answer a question that you ask of the subjects in your soon to be released film, Race to be Human. Um, First of all, thank you for allowing me to view the director's cut and to see it before um, it has actually been released in preparation for this conversation. It is so powerful. I cannot wait for people to see it. It's such an important film. So here's the question that you ask everybody that I'm going to ask you and ask you to answer it whenever you feel like you want to answer it as you're kind of telling us a little bit of your backstory. And the question is, when did you first realize that you're not white? Oh, wow. Mm. Gosh, I haven't had anyone ask me that. Mm. <laughs> it's funny. Um, you know, it's, uh, people ask me, like, how how did you know to even, what made you think of asking that question to the kids you were interviewing? Mm-hmm. And it was only because I knew the exact moment that I knew I wasn't white and it was in third grade in Breckenridge, Colorado at my little school. And I was the only, I'm being Chinese. I was the only kid of color in the whole County and they hated me. Um, it was old fashioned bullying. They would kick and spit on me and smash my lunch, rip up my report card. This was a daily thing. And, um, and then I got locked in a closet in a little cupboard in one of the classrooms. And I was literally there like the whole afternoon Nobody came to look for me. Nobody was miss. Nobody thought I was missing. And I just remember I had a lot of time with myself in there. And I tried, you know, wanting to get out. There was no one in the classroom even. So I ended up making a promise to myself that if I could ever do anything to help someone else not feel this way, that that would be like my life's mission. And I also thought, gosh, if they just got to know me, they wouldn't hate me so much because I can't, I'm not that bad. I can't be that bad. Um, and of course, in those days, I'd tell my parents or whatever, and they were like, well, then they're not, if they act like that. They're not worth having as friends, you know, just ignore them, walk away. And it was really hard. Um, I, I then sort of grew up and we moved to Denver and it was a little more sort of, um, a lot more people, still only kid of color in the school, the new school. But I had a couple of like, actually, they were like um, a friend of mine who was Jewish. She reached out to me and <laughs> she was Jackie Chorney and she um, was my sort of first friend. And, um, and I used to say, don't hang out with me because there's a residual effect hanging out with me, but she didn't care. And then I kind of became a bystander and I liked that safe space. And I didn't stand up for other people because I didn't want to become a target again. Um, and it wasn't until I got older that a little film crossed my desk called finding kind, which is about bullying. And that is, I watched it as a rough cut. They were looking for finishing funds and it just struck me and I flashed back to that little third grade girl in the closet. And I thought, you know what? I have been not honoring my promise to myself all these decades. And I'm gonna take this movie and I wanna take it out into schools, not on the streaming service. And I wanna start having conversation about, about bullying and why people do that and what's going on and how can we be better to each other? And so that's kind of how I started the IndieFlix education a uh, component or aspect of the business. Mm-hmm. And even my board of directors and investors were like looking at me crooked saying, what's what you're going to do little school screenings. You're the CEO of a global streaming service. And I'm like, I know, but I got to do this to honor a promise I made to a third grade girl. And so, um, yeah, we took it to one of my kids' schools. This showed the sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And it had the most profound effect in 90 minutes. And it changed that, the culture there. And before we could figure out how to do it again, schools were calling us. Really? So that started this whole process. And that film to this day is only available in schools. And um, the filmmakers are brilliant and they created a whole program around it. And I learned from them. 
and then got going and did a film called Empowerment Project, same thing with the director, Sarah Moshman, and then worked with, um, helped to fund and produce and to take out a film called Screenagers into schools because we built up this massive school database and then even starting to go organically into corporations. And then, and you can stop me because I tend to go on and on. No, it's, it's, it's <laughs> a friend of mine. Yeah. No, it's okay. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, a friend of mine had said, you're so good at taking films out into schools. You got to make a movie about mental health. And I was just like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know anything about that. And, you know, and, and being Chinese, we don't talk about that. Like that's, that's nobody's business, right? Mm -hmm. That's like saying how much do you weigh or how much money's in your bank account, right? Like right. it's just private. Yeah. And um, so I just said, no, I'm not the person to do that. And she, she was adamant. And, and I got a call on New Year's morning that she had died by suicide, leaving two kids and a husband. And I knew she was struggling, but I didn't know it was that bad. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make a movie about mental health. And I don't even know what that looks like, but I got, I figure I got to approach it in a way that feels universal, like something we can all relate to. And I felt like anxiety was something that everyone has. It's actually a good thing, right? It's part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. And so uh, made angst and took that out into the world, um, which was tough. Yeah, People didn't want to watch it. They were nervous that they were going to open up a whole so can of worms. Well, what you're, what you're doing is taking these awkward, difficult, uncomfortable topics that are central to what makes us human and creating a context and a safe space for us to talk about it. And I think that that is such a valuable skill set and mindset to have, and that you are most definitely honoring your third grade self in, in doing these kinds of films. Um, and so that brings us for the moment, I wanna talk about this new film, The Race to Be Human. I, I cannot wait for people to see it. Um, it is when I, I've watched it a couple of times, actually two or three times now, and each time I get something more out of it. But I think, you know, just by asking that question of, and many of these, you know, these are people of all, all races and genders and, and you're, you know, when did you first realize that you're not white? What is race? What is racism? Let's talk about microaggressions. What's your racial identity? I mean, you are really going all the way there. Um, I guess what I want to know is what, what surprised you in the process of directing and producing this film? What did you expect? And then what surprised you in this process? Well, it's interesting when I asked that question, I would always kick it off that way, right? Like, when did you first realize? And every kid of color would think for a minute. And I think it was one of the first times they'd heard the question, mm -hmm. but they knew the exact moment yep. almost what it sounded like, what it felt like. And I think we remember it because it's more often a, uh, than not a negative experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it becomes this, it helps. It sort of is a defining moment of who you are. And um, everybody reacts differently. One of the greatest uh, takeaways from this film is the incredible resilience and hope that the kids have. And they were anywhere from like, you know, eight years old to 22, 23. Most of them were in that 14 to 16, 17 age bracket. Mm -hmm. And they have lived a life of thousands of microaggressions on a daily basis, not thousands every day, but just over time. And like, there isn't a day that goes by that they don't experience some kind of microaggression. And yet they are hopeful. They are not jaded. They have learned, they have armor. They have learned to protect themselves, but they really do believe that we, we can change. Yeah. Yeah, that was like one of the most beautiful things. Yes, yes, they absolutely do believe that. And one of the things that that really touched me, I, I, I'm thinking about the there was a young white girl and her mother. And this girl, I, I don't even know how old she was. She maybe I'm going to say she was maybe 13, 14, maybe even a little she was younger. At eight, 
eighth grade going into okay so i'm i'm about right around 13 or so and she was so thoughtful and so um gosh i don't even know what the i mean she she expressed herself just so beautifully and you could tell that she had had conversations about this very difficult topic of racism and the concept of white privilege with her parents, her mother, I'm sure. I mean, because you yep. could tell. So tell me a little bit about, about that dynamic of the mother and the child talking about something as polarizing and, and difficult as white privilege and and what you got out of that conversation in that part of the film? So great question. Um, she so she was so um, informed because of her conversations with her family. And I think they had those conversations because they wanted to figure out, like, how can they diversify their lives? Mm-hmm. Right. And And I get asked that, like, And I wanted to address it in the film. Like if you are a white family in a predominantly white neighborhood going to predominantly white school, how are you going to diversify your life? How are you going to create cross-racial friendships? How are we going to expose ourselves, right, to to other uh, backgrounds and cultures and ethnicities? Mm -hmm. And so through that conversation, you know, it's interesting because I – simple things people can do, like go to a, an Indian restaurant. I know it sounds trivial and light, but learning about where food comes from and the importance of it, learning, why are we celebrating Cinco de Mayo? What actually happened in history? Who are we celebrating? Why is this important? Not just the margaritas and the tacos, right? Mm-hmm. Learning about Chinese New Year's and the importance of the red envelope and what, like, if we can start learning about the richness of other cultures, Ramadan, the fact that um, Sarah in the film, who is Muslim and from the Middle East, from having to explain to her counselor every year what Ramadan is, um, and it's the same counselor, yeah. right? Like yeah. those kinds of things that um, could just, if we could learn about our each other's histories, our lives would be so much richer and we would have more compassion and we'd look at each other as human beings and people. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and approaching it, approaching those kind of conversations with genuine curiosity, not, well, what is that? Or why do you do that? Yeah. Or, you know, where are you really from? Or what, what's that? You know what I'm saying? It's in an accusatory yeah. or a judgmental sort of way or whatever, but as opposed to having genuine curiosity and wanting to learn about someone else's culture and what makes it special and 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 different and as you said rich and one of the things that I always think about that I one of the many things that I love about my husband and he's he's going to love it when he hears this um, is is his genuine curiosity um, to learn about other people's cultures we we had a neighbor who lived right next door to us um, who's from the Middle East. And, and Lou made friends with him and asked questions and learned about the food and the, the, the culture and the religion. And I mean, and to this day, they are still great friends and he's halfway on the other side of the world. But it's that, you know, friendships can be forged when you have that kind of curiosity and one-on-one interaction. It doesn't, it, I don't know what would replace that. Nothing. I mean, it's, and it's free Yes, and it's, it's just your time. And, you know, I mean, my hope is that if we were to enter conversations and look at each other from a place of curiosity and love, instead of fear and judgment, Mm -hmm. the world would be a completely different place. And here's what I love about movies is that movies, the audience becomes an active listener. You know, when we're having conversations, we're kind of feeding off of each other. We're thinking about what we're going to say next as you're just finishing your sentence. And, you know, it's, it's, there's this flood of chemicals on the brain and it's so good and exciting. But when you're watching a movie, you're not thinking about what you're going to say. You're, you're watching, you're taking it all in. And so, I mean, I learned this making angst like in the upstanders and especially when kids are talking because they're so unedited, they're so pure. Yeah. They don't have anything to lose, right? And they haven't learned how to like, you know, like create and say what they think you want. Mm-hmm. 
them to say. Mm-hmm. Um, not when it comes to talking about their feelings and when they're brave enough to share what's going on with them. And people listen, parents listen, educators listen, other kids listen. So my hope is that with this film and people listening, you're going to, it's really a movie about definitions, right? Yeah. Told through micro stories. Right, right, right. So, okay. One of the questions that I have for you is about how you think the the film will be um, accepted in places Mm -hmm. where they really don't want to be having the conversation about race. Okay. So I live in Texas. Outlawed. (laughs) Thank you. Hello. That's, you know where I'm going. Okay. I'm in Texas and you know, we're now living in the age of book bans, which I cannot believe and not wanting to teach the history of our country as it happened, but only cherry picking what we want our kids to know. So you have created a film about race. How are you going to get it in schools, particularly in the schools where they don't wanna be having this conversation in the first place, which is the very place that this film needs to be? Yeah. It's a really, that's like the, probably the the biggest question of all Mm -hmm. is how do we actually get people to feel like it's safe to watch? It's okay to watch. Mm -hmm. It's not going to create, um, it's not divisive. It's not going to create tension, but it's going to promote healing and grow, you know, like an empathy and compassion, um, We've already just since as a rough cut and just even in the title alone, before we named it Race to be Human, it was just called Race and it was untitled. That was the working title. And we had two schools in Silicon Valley say, I just want you to know if that's the actual going to be the title, we won't be able to show it. We wouldn't even look at it because of the title. Um, And they just said it's so polarizing. They wouldn't be able to announce to their to their to their families and students that they're bringing this movie in because people would be in an uproar. That's Silicon Valley. That's not even Texas or Florida. We had people, a woman shared, a head of a school shared that she absolutely loved the movie. She absolutely thinks it needs to be seen in their community and that it would be so helpful. But race to be human makes it sound like either we're um, making it sound like white people aren't human, they're not acting like humans, or that people of color aren't considered human. So they're trying to catch up. It would be interpreted in so many different ways that it would create such havoc and problems that she's not gonna bring it in. And it's really unfortunate that that's what the film is called. Wow. We have had people say, you know, you completely missed the mark. You did not talk about police brutality and healthcare disparities and voting and, you know, like the his, the really truthful, dark side of racism, the reality. And, um, you know, so I've heard a lot of it. And the thing is, I like my nickname is fortune cookie. I um, have a silver lining syndrome. Uh, you know, in fact, my husband said he has it too. I tore my Achilles and I'm in a boot, you know, for six to eight weeks. And he said, thank God it's you and not me since I have to use my body to work, you know, as a contractor. And I'm like, yeah, that's a silver lining. But um, (laughs) as far as like, there's this saying in Hollywood, which we have when we're going to like film an actor. And if you have many actors and they all are kind of mumbling and talking, it's called safety in numbers. And uh, you don't have to pay each actor more money because they're mumbling and because there's a group of them, right? And I feel like all we need to do is focus on the schools and the organizations that really want to have this conversation in a healthy, positive, inclusive way that really is, it's so basic, it's so foundational that it's a starting point for all of us. There's no learning disabilities here. Like we're all starting as if we don't know anything other than, of course, our lived experiences, but we're we're redefining the terms. We're it's talking about how the best case scenario on how to use them and some do some don'ts like don't do this because this is what people feel. And so 
if we focus on the ones that want to be part of it and grow that, that light will shine so bright. I think it will help the the ones that aren't interested or are fearful mm -hmm. To yeah. it'll eventually like, seep okay. into those into those cracks and crevices. Exactly. We'll prove that it's okay, safe and healthy yeah. and productive to have these conversations in this context. You know, it's so interesting um, when you shared what the reaction was to the change in the title from race to race to be human. I think it's a brilliant title. And for me, um, it, it means it, it, it's shining a light on our humanity and that really the only race is the human race because race itself is a social construct. We're the ones who created the whole notion and idea of race in that regard, um, yeah. which leads to racism because then it implies that, you know, one, one group is more powerful than, than others. Um, so I, I, it's so interesting that, that people would take that, um, that title, I guess we're all bringing our own perspective and our own lived experience to the interpretation of the title, but you have to start somewhere. And to me, what what is so powerful and brilliant about the film is that it it, it boils it down very simply to our common humanity and the idea of human connection and and that the the real crux of what is ailing us as a society is the disconnect that we are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And by having having these young people especially talk about racism within the context of how it is impacting them at such a young age and just the whole idea yeah. of race is illuminating to me and I I hope people will at least give it give it a chance because I, I think you've created something really special. Well, thank you. I'm really just the messenger. It's these incredible kids and, and they're, I mean, I filmed probably, I feel like I filmed of almost a hundred people mm -hmm. and of all colors from all over. Mm -hmm. And they all had so much to share. And I learned, I would cry. I think I cried in every interview. Um, clearly I have a lot to unpack. And uh, I also had so much empathy for what some of these kids have survived and just still how positive they are. Um, and there is so much hope. That's the one thing I, I learned. I feel like that we've, I think a lot of people feel like they're fearful to talk about it because they don't want to come off as like tone deaf or hurt, like hurt somebody. So everyone's kind of on eggshells. I think. Some people feel like they understand some of the terms, but they're not really using them in the right context. And I feel like the patience level is really being tested right now. When someone says something and the receiving party is not patient mm -hmm. with that person, not understanding, um, like for, here's a perfect example, instead of trying to be so top level, in one of our test screenings, there was a, a a counselor that shared, you know, the, the little feedback on the film would be that the microaggression chapter, you should put in a little something about how people need to be more resilient. They have to understand it's it's a joke. It's a compliment. It's not oh. meant to hurt you. And you should learn to. They're missing the point. Like, understand. They're missing the point. And, yeah. and so, right. But you know, it's so interesting. That was the first q and I'd had as a test screening. And, you know, I'm like in front of, you know, 400 people, a public, you know, just virtually. And I was like, how do I respond? Right. Mm. First time I'd had to sort of deal with that in a public setting to be able to say anything. And I mean, I, I thankfully it was more like a feedback on the film kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, that, thank you so much for that note. I really appreciate that. And what I really meant was I appreciate the opportunity to pause and remind myself that it's important that we meet people where they are because they're, everyone has a lived experience, no matter what color you are. Mm -hmm. And that if you only have so much information, you can only go so far. So obviously it would be great if I could have a conversation with this woman and be able to say, actually, you know, like the people of color, people who've experienced microaggressions are probably more resilient, resilient than you'll, you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And, um, and here's, how? Here's why. Mm -hmm. 
I think people honestly just need more information. Yeah. And also to look back at your history, like where did you learn? Like we just put together, we broke the film up into 11 chapters from the movie. And right now we have two extra chapters that are not in the movie. Mm -hmm. One is about um, words, words and whether it's okay to use the N word and just how words create worlds. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, you know, just the breaking down the pyramid of hate and why it is so important that we address microaggressions and attitudes, because that's where we actually can make change. Mm -hmm. If they left, if they're left unchecked, that's how it escalates right. to genocide. So being able to write these discussion guides, you know, with our, my social impact producer and advisors for a classroom discussion so that the schools don't just watch the movie and have a conversation. They have access to the film for the whole year to have all of it broken down into little bite-sized pieces to have much deeper classroom conversations or at home conversations with families. So we've got at home discussion guides and reflections so we can really just continue to work on the basics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so in, in the show notes, we'll make sure that we um, link to everything that you want us to link to so that schools and, and organizations that are interested in screening the film will, will be able to get to it. So just a moment ago, you alluded to your Hollywood career, which we haven't even really touched on. Um, but <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, you know, you were nominated for an Emmy for being best costume designer on the Wonder Years. You started off in costume design the old wonder year pardon the old, the old wonder, wonder years, years not, the not, reboot. not the reboot right the old wonder, <laughs> wonder years back in the day right which is pretty yeah. amazing so how did you end up moving from costume design to directing and what all the work that you're doing now well i've always loved directing and producing and i did you know in making commercials i was styling and but I also because my boyfriend was the director I was in the editing room I was helping to cast I was kind of doing cutting my teeth in that way but then when I went to LA we broke up and I went to LA and um, started doing like low budget movies out of the trunk of my car you know with clothes I found at thrift stores and things and um, and then I saw the pilot of the Wonder Years after it aired after the Super Bowl and I don't know what happened, but like some arrow shot into me. I, my DNA changed. Like I <laughs> became obsessed and wanted to work on that show. I would have swept the floors. I didn't care what I did. It just, it landed with me in a way like no other movie or show had ever affected me. And I would go down to the studio all the time. Wow. Hi, I'll do anything. Will you hire me? No, we're not hiring. Who are you? Get out of and here. And I would go in like, I bring cookies. I got to know the receptionist. They're like, hey, Sheila, whatever. And one day when I was there, the costume designer was there and she said, I could use her. She can literally clean up the, the wardrobe department and size all of the period clothing. I need, you know, and it's uh, I, I, this ladder on wheels and it would roll around this huge warehouse. And I sized every article of clothing so that you could just go pull it for fittings. And in the process, when she started to do fittings for the next for the episode, because they got a green light to pick it up, she was saying, oh, I need, here's this actor, I need this. And I'm like, I actually know exactly where that is. And I would go and start pulling it and bringing it to her. So she was like so happy with me because I knew the stock so well. I worked with her and then she got fired and they asked me to help train the next designer that came in, who came in. So I'm like, no, they don't like this. They like this. You should do this. And I started, I just was, she goes, why, are you, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> and I said, because they want you and I'm here to help you. And then um, she didn't like the role. So she left. And so they said, we're going to find someone else, but just hang in there and we'll have someone else for you to like support. And I said, I want to do it. And they said, you're too young. And I'm like, okay, that's ridiculous. Because <laughs> Uh, hello, Ooh, I'm ben already Hur doing it. I'm training the new right? people. <laughs> How do you do like a sci-fi movie or a hit movie from history, right? right? So they kind of like said, all right, we'll give you a shot, but just want you to know it might not work out. And I said, that's fine, because I'd never done it before. And so I took over and did it. And I knew all the cast and everybody. So it was a great fit. My first episode, I got nominated for the Emmy. My producer called, he goes, congratulations on your Emmy nomination. And I was like, what's an Emmy? <laughs> like, I didn't even know. <laughs> oh my God, that's priceless. Oh my goodness. And can I tell you, not so off topic, but I did go to the Emmys. My husband gets car sick. So uh, ABC sent a, a limo to pick us up. 
he had to sit up front with the driver because he was throwing up from being car sick sitting in the back. So I sat in the back and drank champagne. And then we went to the Emmys and I wore this chiffon dress and I went to the bathroom and I came back and there got, I'd gotten something black on the bottom of it. So I rinsed it in the sink. It got stuck in my pantyhose. And when I walked back down, my husband said, um, turn around. And he pulled my, my, um, chiffon skirt out of my pantyhose oh my God. and I and then I was like oh my god and I sat down and I was like holy cow <laughs> that is the funniest thing I've ever heard <laughs> and you're probably thinking oh god if they call my name <laughs> please oh my god that would have been awful I think he did that because he was worried because my yeah. I was coming up and I was yeah. nervous yeah. and yeah um so. Oh, what I'm so glad you shared that. That's hilarious. That is hilarious. <laughs> so, um, so you went from the wonder years to do many other, um, I know you did party, party of five, five and yeah. So, I mean, Dawson's Creek, Dawson's Creek, Smallville, right? Didn't you work on Smallville? Yeah, I helped out on Smallville cause they needed some retooling. So I kind of went in and was a fixer on Dawson's Creek. I only did the pilot because um, I didn't want to move to Wilmington, so I actually hired a crew to take over after I did the pilot. That's just amazing. So how how much work are you doing in Hollywood these days? I, none, none, other than I go there once a month for meetings, mm -hmm. uh, more on the executive level. And, of course, I'm always filming there because I just have crew and people. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's a huge part of my life there, um, even though I'm based in Seattle and Seattle is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent a lot of time in Breckenridge, but. I really, you know, when I moved here, I was in uh, sixth grade, and this is kind of where my formative years were spent and my dearest friends are. So once the Race to Be Human is released and that whole ball is rolling, what's what's next? What's your vision now um, in the next year or two, three years for Indie Flicks? What are you, what are you trying to achieve? What do you want to do? Wow. You sure asked on the right day. Um and this is my first time talking about it publicly. So I actually don't know that I'm going to say it right because I'm learning. It's sort of like building the plane while you're flying okay. it. Um, so, you know, we had a plan to be at Sundance and then Sundance turned 100% virtual. So we weren't going to be there in person, which was kind of this whole thing we were going to do to do a social impact report on angst, like in The Upstanders, those three mental health films and then talk about race and tee that up and be able to um, just share that. But then when we became fully virtual, we decided to fast track by a year, a plan that we had to release and share this content on the blockchain and create NFTs that are kind of more like mental health related and in fact, I'm sitting here next to, I wrote a book called The Creative Coping Toolkit, and it actually has some hacks in it that um, it's it's one that you don't have to read cover to cover. It's got like fun stuff in it. It's really, um, it's all like evidence-based brain science kind of stuff that you can do at home, you can do at work, you can do anywhere that helps change your brain. And to, it kind of gamifies talking about your feelings to help normalize talking about mental health, mm. right? The, the bottom of the pyramid and um, of mental health. And so now we're like creating these NFTs that have some of the exercises from the Creative Coping Toolkit and exclusive clips from the films. And we're gonna share the power of story, the power of movies, the power of community to heal. And, and to make us stronger, to make us more resilient and, and to, you know, like, I mean, there's my head sort of flooded with opportunity. Um, and we've built a discord community an IndieFlix discord community where I'm going to go. And I'm, I've, I'm thinking I've just signed up on a meeting that we had earlier this morning that I'm going to do coffee every morning for 10 days. And we're going to make angst available for free to anyone in the world to watch and learn about how we can help ourselves and how we can help others. It's really easy. It's so simple and we can do it. And it doesn't need to like turn our worlds upside down and it can make the biggest difference. So race to be human. This is what I think is so amazing. And I 
I'm still wrapping my head around it, but I believe that like, how do I say this? This is where I'm the first time saying this. Right now, the only currency really is green, right? Like it's money. Mm -hmm. But those gatekeepers are predominantly white. And so how do we, how do we decentralize that, right? The blockchain, yeah. cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. I believe that that technology can have a huge impact on addressing racism. That anyone of color can have the opportunity to create wealth. And that by not having to follow this conveyor, this formula, this factory line of what we're all trying to like fit in and be, that's not going to be the way it's going to be. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a total shift. It's a completely different, I mean, it's like the internet, you know, in 1995, right? So, yeah. yeah. So, wow. Well. So I'm so excited. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just, <laughs> like I said, putting one paper down and stuffing on it. And then like, where are we? I'll keep putting the next one down. But yeah. it's so exciting to me and it feels right. And, um, you know, people used to say, oh, you're so brilliant filming kids. Like, gosh, kids are so smart. Kids are our future. We need to be paying our teachers more. We need to be giving our schools. They need to be number one priority. This, a kid should not be worried about a school shooting and doing active shooter drills. Teachers should not be being trained on caring to protect the students. We Our focus is in the wrong place. We need to way more funding, way more everything. And I think that blockchain cryptocurrency there are colleges now who are creating NFTs that are bringing them more funding than they've ever had to be able to make programs richer and stuff. The possibilities are endless. And the transparency factor, the smart contracts, like it's just, um, and bringing content in and delivering that and finding also creative ways for ordinary filmmakers who might've made a horror movie I want to be able to offer them the ability to push some buttons on our site and be able to create NFTs and be able to build community around them and what they're doing in their missions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that breaking news with us <laughs> <laughs> as to what is. I may sound like I'm not knowing what I'm talking no, about because it's just no, so much I, information. I love it. And, you know, I am such a novice. I, you know, I understand a little bit about blockchain and NFTs, but but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's still a learning curve for, you know, for me and I'm sure for, you know, millions of people who are still trying to wrap their, their heads around what it all means. But I think somebody with your, um, your chops, if you will, you know, your resume and, and especially your passion and your heart and your empathy, um, being in that space and helping to create uh, positive change and to and to and to create more of a of an equal playing field as you were saying for generating wealth I think it's just phenomenal so um, I will certainly be be watching that um, can I can I add one yes, thing to that I just do feel like, absolutely you didn't ask this question but I did want to mention I am starting two more movies this year Yay. because I've just because I've been wanting to do them for a while and I put them off to make race to be human but I'm making a movie called Money, which is all about conversations that we have in our families about money and the impact that it has on our mental health mm -hmm. and how the world is changing from what, you know, the gold standard to, you know, crypto. And also, like, why do we give up our power to someone with money? Right. Like what what is going on there? Why is the idea that having all the money in the world is the most important thing. It isn't, right? And so I am so excited to have that conversation and to share that with the mm -hmm. world. And the other one is about, um, right now the working title is called The Talk, which isn't right, but it's basically like how are we learn about, you know, how do we identify what is consent, um, boundaries? Okay. How do we respect our bodies? Evolving sex ed, you know, just having that conversation because I think it's again, it's a it's one with a lot of confusion, right? Like my kids are always correcting me and they're like, so and so is a they them. Stop saying she her or you know, like and so I'm like, okay, we need to make a movie I, about thank this. Thank you. I'm so glad you're doing that. Both of those topics are 
just right, right on the money. <laughs> but yeah, but the, <laughs> but the second. So I always say I'm making a movie about sex and another one about money now. Yeah, and I um, love it. I, I, and we'll tie it into racism. We'll tie it into mental health. We'll tie it into technology. It's all like it's all that's our it's all connected. It's all connected. Yeah, and create curriculum around it. Yes. Yes, cre create curriculum around it so that it's not just the film and a conversation and then that's it. It has to be an ongoing, yeah. um, an ongoing conversation that connects the dots between uh, among all of the different um, areas of interest and, and totally. import and import. Totally. So um, as we wrap up this conversation, even though I don't want to stop talking to you, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> um, I, what is it that you'd like to leave our audience with in terms yeah. of, um, I guess, hope for our future? You you talked a lot about it um, or a little bit about it when you mentioned the young people in the race to be human and how interviewing them gives you hope for our future. Um, I know I personally have been struggling lately to feel hopeful and joyful about just being here and living life. And, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed and I, I have a wonderful life, but it's, it's increasingly challenging to feel that sense of joy just in everyday things and, and a real sense of hope for my future and for that of my daughter and the children that she has yet to have. So I'm always interested in hearing, especially from someone like you who is devoted her life to telling stories that matter and creating content that's going to have an impact for the better. So what, what can you leave us with um, as we wrap up our conversation? Oh, it's such a good question. And, and by the way, you, you know, you're my first interview talking about this so I'm Everything that comes out of my mouth is new and it's the first time. Um, I'm an energy person. It's kind of my radar. It guides me on whether I'm acting out of integrity with myself or if I'm surrounding myself with toxic people. Like it's really my, it guides me on every level. And I think that our words are so important, not necessarily what other people are going to think when they hear them come out of us, but how we feel when we say them. Mm -hmm. So and the energy behind our words is key. And so, you know, like for instance, with sexual harassment, it's like, oh, you look nice today. I'm, I'm, they're not objectifying you. Or if like, you look nice today. Like that may be more so. So your delivery, your timing, your tone, your energy. And how it makes you no feel matter. when those words come out of your mouth. I love that. So if we could just slow down a little bit and just um, when we speak, when we express ourselves, if we could put just regulate what's the energy behind what you're about to say, um, that energy is the most powerful thing that is on the receiving end. And it's also what we run in our bodies. So focus on the things that are working in your life. Focus on the things that are good turn off the news if that's what you have to do. Because if we can start running better energy in our bodies and we can start putting out better energy in our bodies and we can look in the mirror and say good things to ourselves, when you are modeling that good energy in your body, that's what comes back to you and you're modeling it for other people how they can be. And so I guess the bottom line is be good to yourself, be kind to yourself, love yourself, and then like the next person closest to you, be kind to them. And, but it starts with us. It does. It, no matter what color you are. Yes. <laughs> no matter what, no matter, what upbringing you have. It starts with us, you know, each one of us as a human being and a member of the human race. It starts with each one of us. Yeah. yeah. Model. When you know, I hear this all the time, model the new paradigm, right? I wanted to make a movie that modeled the new paradigm. You watch it, you go, oh my God, I can live like that. It's not a new paradigm. It is who we are meant to be. It's not new. It's what, who we sh we're supposed to be. We've gotten off the tracks. Yeah. And so let's just go, ugh, let's put the luggage down. Let's just be ourselves. I love it. 
Just be kind. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. And that is the perfect place to end our conversation. Sheila Andreen, you are a gift. You are an absolute yeah. gift. Thank you so much for the work that you do and for the energy that you put out and for sharing yourself and who you are with our audience today. Thank you so very much. Oh, Linda, thank you so much. If you're interested in a screening of Race to be Human, just go to the show notes for the link to that and everything else that Sheila and Indie Flicks are doing. Thanks again to all of you for joining us for another episode of our Voices Matter podcast. Really appreciate you being a part of our audience. If you've not already done so, please do subscribe, like, and share. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks again to our sponsor, BMW of West Houston. There's a special offer for members of the Our Voices Matter podcast community. Just click the link in the show notes, bmwwest.com.